chance to kind of try it out. Uh, to try to tie it all back together and talk about what um, we've come to call the depositivist uh, style. Uh, and, and I'll say more about what that uh, means in just a second. Whoops, there we go. Oh, no, one too many. Um, so uh, as I was uh, talking with, uh, chatting with David beforehand, both Kim and I started graduate school in uh, 1987, Kim in anthropology at Rice at the time when um, the writing culture and uh, uh, anthropology as cultural critique had both just uh, come out and were shaping uh, a, a lot of the conversations in the United States. Uh, and me in the history of science, which is where I uh, originally um, started and then very quickly moved to the kind of contemporary uh, period. This was in anthropology, of, uh, again, in, in the US at least, a very experimental uh, moment that was driven by um, interdisciplinarity, uh, interest in, in and uh, energized by post-structuralist sensibilities, generally speaking from linguistics, philosophy, literature, feminist theory, et cetera, et cetera and a concern and focus and attention to the materiality, uh, the limits and the excesses of signs and signifying systems and all that comes with that of language ideologies, genres and styles of uh, anthropological text, performativity, et cetera, et cetera. So Kim uh, initially, as many of you might know, um, did her field work uh, in Bhopal in India in the aftermath of the Bhopal disaster. But part of that, and then extending forward um, since then, has been a real concern with environmental information uh, and uh, environmental databases and providing and the changes that came uh, in, in the US with right to know laws and the development of the, the first uh, archives of toxic information, toxic, the toxic release inventory uh, being one of those. And that continues to be a central part of her work in different environmental justice in, or environmental injustice uh, situations. For me, coming through a study of uh, genomics in particular, but the life sciences more generally, part of this, that for, for me is the uh, uh, analysis and documentation of the incredible proliferation of different kinds of databases and different kinds of biological information and the attempts and the work of the scientific communities of those very different uh, scientific cultures to get their data to speak to each other and to combine it in different ways. So data and data practices have been at the, the center or near center of both of our work for a long time and is now uh, kind of firmly ensconced. The other thing I wanna say about kind of what, what has structured our uh, uh, approach and, and where we are now is that from 2007 to 2010, we became editors of cultural anthropology at a moment in which the uh, sh shift or, or the addition of the digital to the print uh, was underway. We were the first to build digital infrastructure for the journal, which you know has really developed incredibly since we, and also this was the origin of our uh, interest in and commitment to uh, open access uh, and open source uh, technologies, open access uh, publications. We invested as much in the print uh, uh, version of the journal as we did in the digital. Uh, so it was never, it's never an either or for us. And I think you'll see more examples of that as, as we, we, we go on. Um, so on the notion of experimented, experimentation that we use when we talk about the platform for experimental uh, ethnography, it comes in particular from the biologist and historian and philosopher and deconstructionist uh, Hans-Jörg Reinberger, who's written a lot about experimentation in the, uh, in the life sciences in, in particular. And I'm not gonna read the entire quote, but the, um, the, the thrust of it is that experimentation depends on this combination of stabilization and destabilization. It has to have both. 
um, the, the stabilization and the reproducibility that kind of has to be there as this grounding engine, but it also somehow has to remain open and be able to produce surprises and results that you were not anticipating in order in his terms to count for at, count as an experimental system. And we keep that uh, uh, definition in mind all the time. And uh, again, Hans Jörg uh, is part of a now quite widespread uh, community of people who look at data and experimentation, uh, the data practices, experimental practices in the anthropology uh, of um, science. So um, around 2012, we were then at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York, which is a small um, uh, engineering, largely engineering school. Um, and there, there were a lot of people who had become an, involved as in, in the leadership of the Research Data Alliance, which is still an, an ongoing organization. And it's an international organization whose tagline, as you can see, is to build the social and technical bridges to enable the open sharing and reuse of data. This was a interest for Kim and I in terms of the environmental sciences that Kim studies and the, the life sciences for me and their um, intersections. Um, and we also became more interested in what it means to try to share anthropological data in a discipline um, which does not have uh, extensive history of uh, data sharing and, and making it open and, and how technically that would uh, could be done. So a, as part of our involvement in the Research Data Alliance, we started an interest group called the Digital Practices and History of Ethnography. We went to those meetings. They have, they have meetings every um, six, six months and we're really in close conversation with um, those people. And at that time, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this later too, we, uh, at, at RPI, there was not a very large humanities presence. We were the anthropologists there. Um, I was kind of <laughs> the, the historian there. Uh, and so we really ended up uh, working closely and talking a lot with, uh, in this case, uh, particularly interest, the, the computer scientists, the people who were building um, the semantic web that the internet kind of now um, runs on. So that was, that, that has been very formative um, for us. Um, to just now sort of set the scene for uh, how we've come to think about archives, there was a very uh, a, a sober uh, with a very, you know, business-like uh, and uh, unpretentious uh, cover from the Council of uh, Council on Library and Information Resources in, in 2000 about the now um, developing digital technologies for uh, archiving. And the language here, just, uh, uh, although it's about the prolif the growing number of different um, metadata standards and trying to get uh, uh, different platforms and archives to, to speak to each other, and that these were specific to different kinds of communities, which is something that we were definitely um, seeing in the Research Data Alliance. The language was still very much on uh, convergence, that you, you have these differences, but the emphasis was, okay, we can get those uh, differences to, to speak to each other and to converge on a set of um, standards or common kinds of, of discourses. In about 15 years, that was all, the language entirely shifts. And uh, the same author, Anne Gilliland, who is at the UCLA Information uh, School, um, produced an edited volume with contributions from multiple uh, disciplines uh, in the human sciences and in the natural sciences on re research in the archival multiverse. So the explosion now uh, of those communities and their particular uh, ways of talking about uh, information and archives and uh, Although they're still talking to each other, the notion of convergence is pretty much uh, gone, and it's now just 
these kind of multiple exploding worlds, both in the archival cultures, as well as in the, the wider uh, popular uh, culture as well. And that's, I think that's the situation we find ourselves in now. And it's, and it's really quite exciting, although also a little bit uh, disorienting. At around the same time, um, we were noticing, and we uh, interviewed Deb Winslow, who for a long time was at the National Science Foundation in the anthropology uh, division here, uh, about her experience with data sharing in anthropology. In the United States, uh, in the early years of the Obama administration, there was a new emphasis on the open government initiative, which was making all government data open and, and available. Um, the National Science Foundation here began requiring people to have uh, data management plans um, and to open up their publications that came out of NSF funded uh, research. And as Deb, as Deb Winslow told us, you know, that has been a, a work in progress for anthropologists. The physical anthropologist had had some uh, uh, tradition and practice of making their data more widely uh, uh, available, but for cultural anthropology, that was really not part of the scene. And she talked there about when they first had people coming in with their data management plans, they looked very much like IRB uh, applications, and the emphasis was on protecting uh, privacy, making sure you anonymize people uh, and, and places. And so it really worked uh, against the uh, idea of uh, data sharing and making your data more open. So that was the sort of tide that we really wanted to, to swim against and to see how uh, it, it could be uh, it, it done and changed to be more uh, uh, open. So the kind of questions uh, about data um, that were, were generally part of our research, but now we came to uh, train on uh, culture anthropology of uh, how is our data given and, and made and in between and both of those things at the same time? What are data for? Um, what do they signify? What kinds of beliefs do people have about data and its value, et cetera, et cetera. And we call these um, either data ideologies or part of a language or larger language or, or, or semiotic ideology in cultural anthropology that works uh, against uh, archiving data in such a way that it can be shared uh, openly. A lot of it has to do with um, the previous uh, slide and Deb Winslow saying that, you know, people were bringing the IRB uh, uh, process in and this idea that data is first and foremost about privacy and anonymity. Um, there's also a kind of scholarly enclosure uh, that's certainly not unique to anthropology, but is more unique to the humanities and the social sciences than it is to the, the natural sciences, that these are my field notes, these are my interlocutors, et cetera, et cetera. And there's this real ownership and individualism that, that goes along with that. Also, a, an, uh, a, a, what we call an anthropological exceptionalism that um, really we think over fetishizes the complexity and, and subtlety of both our what data is for us and what interpretation uh, is. And we've numerous uh, times have had people say to us, it's like, I, I, I'm the only one who can really understand my data and my, my field notes. And it becomes uh, out of the years that I've spent with this community and, and so on and so on. So it doesn't make sense for me to share um, my, my data. And then a, a enduring othering of the, the sciences, the natural sciences, and their vocabularies, their epistemologies, kind of everything that they stand for, and the idea that we do something uh, different and don't have anything to learn from or contribute back to or share with those scientists. And so that all of these things and more work against um, the, the sharing of data. And so we were trying to figure out what it would take to sort of counteract that. 
So this is when in around 2012 really is when we first started developing the platform for experimental and collaborative ethnography. And I will point just say more about this too uh, in, in a bit, but there's a difference between the, the platform itself, a uh, piece at the top, and then one of the instances we call them that we run is called World Peace, where we do our research for how to design the platform and how to continue to design the platform. But we also run these other instances that are devoted to different communities with slightly different topics, the disaster, STS network, uh, science and technology studies, infrastructure, the asthma files, which was our first uh, platform and continues to be the kind of home for our thinking and, and experimentation and, and figuring out how to, how to do all of these things. And here now at the, the Center for Ethnography at uh, Ir Irvine. So uh, just to stress again that the, the Peace platform is, is itself more than an archive. It's an open source uh, technology for uh, archivalization uh, that anybody uh, can go to GitHub, which is where that code sits. It's a Drupal uh, distribution, and I'll say a little bit more about Drupal too, so that you can install it, get it up and running and begin to build your own uh, archive um, for free. Um, it, nothing is ever <laughs> free, but the idea that it, it is open for, for anybody who, who wants to, to use it and document and to continue to develop it. So I, I can say more about that too uh, as I go and when we come back in the, the questions and so on. So a number of uh, other organizations have started to uh, run their own instances of the platform at the University of Hamburg, um, the Energy Rights Project, which is in Philadelphia. And one that I'll say a little bit more about later, uh, the Research Data Share, which is about qualitative researchers and archives in um, Nairobi, uh, Kenya. Because it's a Drupal distribution and you can install it, um, it, it is open, but it always can carries what we call our design logics, that we've designed this in a particular way. And by uh, adopting it, uh, users are in effect agreeing to kind of use the design logics and the way that it's been designed in, in particular ways um, to, to, to carry out their work in, in a way that structures that work. And, and I'll, I'll say more about those design logics in, in just a bit uh, as well. So in general, the, the, the platform is not, and it's not simply an archiving uh, platform, but that is a big uh, part of it to stabilize uh, anthropological data. But it's also a research environment where people can do uh, analysis of that data and, and share it too. And it's also a publishing platform where that data can be published along with uh, the analyses along with a kind of more polished presentation in different kinds of forms, uh, timelines, photo essays, and uh, what we call the, the peace essay. And I'll give you some example of those. So this has been a real challenge. Many platforms do one of these. Um, we wanted to do all of them and kind of make a sort of one-stop shop for um, doing anthropological analysis and, and publication. So um, to pick up again on the design logics and the way that the platform is structured, Joanna Drucker, who's also at the UCLA um, School of Information, uh, and Patrick Svensson uh, talk about in terms of uh, middleware. Um, and they draw attention to how we don't often, especially in the humanities, there's little attention paid to how the material infrastructure for knowledge production and how that shapes the kinds of statements you can make, the arguments that you can make, the analyses that you can do that uh, our knowledge, this despite it being in this um, immaterial, apparently immaterial uh, space is really quite shaped by the materiality uh, of the means of production. So 
we designed um, uh, our pl platform by looking at and analyzing a lot of other platforms and their material production uh, of of knowledge and how the how those archives in, are structured and i'll say more about that too and to do what they say is paying precise attention to the way the tools structure our arguments that um, many platforms like uh, Omeka, which is a kind of library exhibit museum uh, uh, platform, um, Scalar, WordPress, um, are more than just kind of dis content display devices, but they really condition organic or and organized production at every level. Uh, the very nature of what constitutes a file, the smallest unit of semantic value, the syntax of connections and relations, means of manipulation or use of intellectual content is determined by the platform's capacities. So the middleware is a set of mediating and remediating protocols that introduce semantic inflection through the way that they're organized. So let me develop that a, a, a little bit um, more. Um, Drupal, they uh, analyzed Drupal in, in one of the sections of this paper, and this is the, the uh, software um, that, that we use, and it runs on what are called nodes that are basically content agnostic. It can be an image, it can be a document, it can be a video, uh, and, and it can be other uh, kinds of uh, data uh, object. They are structural, but not semantic. Um, they serve the purpose of giving the smallest unit of content an identity without constraining it according to what it contains. Uh, and those uh, units of content can be uh, assembled in, in many ways. They point out that this is basic database activity. And this is where, uh, again, the, the archive bleeds into the, the database and they have ele elements uh, of each and Drupal can perform those kinds of operations down to a very detailed level of granularity, provided the data is structured properly. And this is where, again, that stabilization to get destabilization uh, comes in. Um, it's not to say that uh, the discursive modalities or the modes of knowledge are, are not reducible to the database, but there are statements that can be made and statements that cannot, given the constraints of design. Um, I, for a while, we were trying to build on a different open source content management system called Plone, which did not have this structure, and we gave it up in, in large part because of these very concerns and the desire to have these units that can be reassembled in different ways that did not come with their uh, kind of pre-existing structure, and I can say more about that too. So this is our data model, and this is the way that all of those data objects, the different ones, are, are related together. And it is quite stable. We've um, paid uh, Drupal developers lots of money to, to stabilize this and to build those relationships in so that we can achieve the kind of destabilization that um, we are after. Um, Gayatri Spivak sometimes talks about this in terms of abuse of using a technology or using a language um, from underneath um, uh, with its ground mind under. But we actually did not get come to the concept of abuse through uh, Spivak. We came through it to it through a computer scientist and web scientist at RPI, Jim Hendler, who was um, trying to build a, a, a search tool, a, a web surfer that was not predicated on identity and sameness, um, but drawing inspiration from Borges' uh, short story that uh, speaks about the Chinese encyclopedia, the Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge, uh, where the animals are divided into these, you know, different, rather uh, uh, unusual categorization scheme. And this is the, also the story that M Michel Foucault, in the, the Order of Things, um, uses to, to illustrate how our knowledges are organized and that uh, 
stories like this, fables like this can break up all of the ordered surfaces and all of the planes with which we are accustomed to tame the wild profusion of existing things and continue long afterwards to disturb and threaten with collapse our age old distinction between the same and the other. So it was those kinds of destabilizing uh, effects that um, we were after that Jim Hendler was after with his um, search uh, new search tool, which was never really um, built, but remained in uh, his kind of uh, imagination and the, the sort of proposal. And in part, it can't, it can only sort of be built because it does embody this essential contradiction, if not an impossibility of combining uh, um, sameness and difference and working both of these, combining complexity with uh, ambiguity, uh, combining what the uh, digital technologies are quite good at, which is that stabilization part, with the part that they really don't know how to do, which is the ambiguity and the complexity um, and, and that component. And they refer to the trick uh, uh, to find these kinds of algorithms that would allow this. Artificial intelligence is kind of getting there um, and it superseded what, what they were talking about here, but it was a vision that really uh, uh, affected us profoundly and gave us uh, confidence that we weren't crazy to be after this. In, in some ways, it can be summed up with an image of which we collect multiple examples of the famous Wittgensteinian uh, duck rabbit, um, which are often, uh, you know, plays with the the difference that is in the sameness and the sameness that is uh, in difference. And David, in an earlier piece on uh, anthropological knowledge, um, also kind of we read him as uh, in the same sort of territory that in this space, anthropology and anthropological knowledge can either be scientific or, or postmodern or, or both. Um, and it's that uh, play and that, that flip and that combination um, that we are very much after um, and much to the kind of sometimes puzzlement of many of our colleagues who don't quite get like why we think anthropology actually has a lot to share with and learn from uh, the, the, the sciences as well as being something entirely uh, different. So this is another uh, playful meaning of um, peace that rather than war between uh, the, the sciences and the humanities, there, there is a way uh, to, to, to have uh, peace while recognizing our, our uh, differences. So now let me read uh, uh, very quickly just a couple of other uh, digital infrastructures to give a sense of the different data ideologies that go along with them, the different designs that they have. Um, uh, and a lot of our analysis and how we think about infrastructure and archives in particular um, comes from Derrida's archive fever, where the health of the archive is in its sickness, that its stability it is made useful by it, its instability. It, the, the closure uh, of it, uh, it can be, uh, needs to be made open in the same way that an experimental uh, system is. So the first one I just wanna say a little bit about is the human resources area files, which is probably one of the longest running uh, anthropological archives and um, databases. And in all of these cases, we look at how data is selective and selected and produced, uh, how it's curated, how it's structured, how it's connected, and then where interpretation happens and where narration happens. And you know, in, in HREF, it, it's, it, its persistence is in part because its material infrastructure has changed, but the initial paper card catalog kind of version, which is how it was distributed and people received, you know, these slips of paper every year or, or libraries did, 
that the metadata there and the structure of the data persisted as it shifted to the first microfiche and then to CD-ROM and then finally to the web. But even though the, the metadata has been expanded and the amount of information is dramatically expanded and, and the categories have multiplied, the same basic structure is there and it's highly structured the, ca the categories are fairly rigid. Um, they can be added to, but they can't really be played with. So in the 64 cultures of North America, um, environmental toxicologists is, is not one of those uh, cultures. Again, this is not a, a, at all a, a, a wrap on HRAP, um, but just to say that because of the way the archives are structured and the categories that they contain and allow to work with through metadata, it, 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 you, you can make some statements, but not uh, uh, others. It's a great teaching tool and research tool for many people, but it doesn't uh, particularly help uh, us who are trying to understand other kinds of, of um, uh, communities. And it is a data source. There is no really way to work on that platform. Any narration that you do is off uh, site. Almost the complete opposite is a project that we quite admire and we're in, in uh, contact with the organizers at uh, Columbia University and the City University of New York, Project Toxic Docs, which runs uh, uh, on and has millions uh, of documents, largely through Freedom of Information Act requests and um, legal proceedings. Uh, that were once secret and that they are now opening up for researchers to work with. This database is almost, and this archive is almost completely unstructured. Um, you can search, but there's no um, narration that goes along with it. There's no interpretation provided. It really is like the, the documents that, that you can find it and do dis discovery with but there's no hierarchy, there's no categorization scheme really uh, of any uh, kind other than through the, the search function. One thing that um, we really quite like about it is that it does have a shuffle button. So there's a kind of randomization to the ar archive that when you're in there, you can just call up anything that you weren't expecting. And we like this sort of provision of noise. Um, Elizabeth Pavanelli did a, an experiment a while ago with trying to share some of her original um, video material. Um, I, I won't say a, a lot about this, this project, which was quite interesting and quite lovely and beautiful, but also not reproducible at, at all. The only way you can get access to it now is through the, the way um, back machine. Um, it was a limited amount of data and it was very structured in the way that you could move um, th through it. Um, but it was a great experiment in how to share more data than your analysis was um, uh, uh, using. The, the last example that I wanna talk about is, is Mukatu, which was developed by Kim Kristen at um, uh, the University of Washington. It too runs on uh, Drupal. And it is large, used largely by um, Native American uh, communities to build their own archives and put their own uh, materials into. It's been um, pretty widely adopted now. One way that they tag data that's quite um, useful and in innovative is what they call traditional knowledge uh, licensing. So uh, Creative Commons, which is what we use, is much too sort of broad for them. They need to be able to license according to, uh, can, can only women see this data? Is it culturally sensitive in some ways? Is it seasonal? Is it sacred, et cetera, et cetera? Can it be commercialized? So this is a, a, a really uh, interesting and valuable way to organize data for um, these communities in, in uh, particular. So here, the, what counts as data is entirely a, of their selection, what they choose to upload and, and, and not, and who can have access to it. It's very highly curated. It uses the, many of the same metadata uh, fields um, that we do. 
but that data remains kind of uh, uh, isolated. It's not connected. You're presented with one uh, piece and then you can kind of move on to the next piece. And there's no way to add interpretation back into the, the system. So these were some of the design um, constraints and the design principles that we were trying to work with and against in uh, developing peace as middleware with its own um, kind of, with its own semiotic ideologies. And let me just say a little bit about that. I had mentioned the traveling uh, design logics and just to uh, I mention a couple of those that come from anthropology, um, Marilyn Strathern's uh, uh, statement that uh, anthropology's major uh, trick uh, uh, up its sleeve is that it always collects more than it knows what to do with currently. And this we think is a, a great reason to like to share it that you, other people will make use of your data that you didn't imagine that uh, could be used that way. And Jim Clifford's notion of ethnographic uh, surrealism, its own kind of experimentalism that um, some arguments and some uh, narrations work on uh, juxtaposition rather than integration and the ability to lay elements um, side by side, both for comparison, but also just to kind of exist by, uh, side by side is one of the principles that, that we wanted to design our platform to do. So again, all of this has to be stabilized. In order to be stabilized, we have extensive metadata fields that any contributor uh, of a, an image or a document or uh, other kinds of artifact uh, uh, has to fill out uh, all of these in order to get their data into the, the system. That allows to, um, and we built the search function such that it searches across all parts of the system. So none of our projects on the Center for Ethnography are about style, but if you search on the term style, you can get annotations uh, of objects that uh, use the word style. You can find it in different artifacts, textual artifacts, um, you can find it in, in photo essays. So uh, these kind of emergent categories that aren't coded into the platform, but are there and can be made available for research and for future knowledge production um, it is, was part of our um, design. The other thing that we designed in, in, in terms of that data model and the relations that we built in an annotation function where every object can be annotated by multiple people. Um, you can add, we don't use tags, but we use questions uh, that prompt more of a, a, a open uh, a co contribution. Um, it, people can add questions. Uh, questions can be questions once they're in there stay, which leads to this long proliferation sometimes uh, of questions. But the the function has worked really well to both guide uh, the analysis while leaving it open to individual uh, in interpretations that are then shared as part of the archive. They become part of the archive, become part of the the data. Um, and then all of those can be rearranged according to, you can organize around the question, you can organize around the artifact, you can organize uh, around the, the individual uh, user, uh, all of that data, because those connections have been structured, con constructed, can be structured in, in uh, different ways and different parts can be brought into view so that um, you can begin to do analysis of how people analyze uh, uh, documents. At the same time, it is used a lot as an archiving uh, tool. Um, this is one of the most uh, developed archives now uh, that connects uh, researchers and activists around Formosa Plastics, which is an international conglomerate uh, and, and toxic uh, producers from Calhoun County, Texas to uh, Taiwan, uh, to Cambodia and, and um, Vietnam. They can share materials, they can analyze these together. 
Um, a, a lot of these are community uh, gray matter and, and, and ephemera that might otherwise never be uh, a, a available in a official uh, a, a archive, but have been provided with an archival home um, here. You can also then build stories and narrations around those documents and use those documents uh, in ways in these what we call these um, piece essays, which um, can contain a, a analysis, the ethnographer's own uh, narration, other people's narrations, um, transcripts of, uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, conferences that um, Angela Acuna, who runs this uh, instance of peace, was doing in uh, Nairobi with librarians and archivists and uh, people who are doing uh, commercial qualitative uh, research and trying to share this data in, in um, new ways. This was part of her um, dissertation project that was really just quite exciting um, to see. So uh, this, the principles of juxtaposition and so on, I'm gonna uh, skip that um, slide and just trickly, quickly try to wrap up now. Um, we call this depositivism as a play on both um, uh, away from positivism and, and away from the kind of positivistic notion of one me one one object one uh, meaning um, but at the same time a deepening of positivism and a kind of disseminating um, way uh, and based on the constant depositing of materials into an archive in order to be shared. So uh, depositivism is our name for the attempt to do all, all of those things at once, which proceeds through these different levels of uh, interacting with um, data um, from its finding or its creating or its reco recollecting in, in many uh, different ways. To, to structuring it in particular ways to make it available to other people and to be used by uh, uh, other people as well, to annotate in a way that becomes part of the archive and becomes attached to the, the data in, in, in a new way, and then to compose it and narrate it into photo essays, the piece essays as I, I showed you. Um, and to play around with what is highlighted, what's backgrounded, what becomes figure, what's ground, um, and to, to keep, keep on building these kinds of materials and, and um, new connections and, and, uh, hope, and, and often quite um, surprising uh, events that, that we hadn't anticipated. Um, that data, if it needs to be private, it can be private. We really spent a lot of time in designing a, the, a system that would allow complete uh, encrypted uh, privacy uh, of data when that was necessary. But the default position is to share it either with a, a group and it can be restricted to a group or make the entire archive or the entire parts of that, of, the, of a larger archive uh, completely uh, public and available for anybody um, to use. And this is the last slide that I'll really uh, show and, and talk about. It comes from um, uh, Peter Gallison and Lorraine Dastin, the historians of uh, science who talk about how uh, uh, the ideals uh, of objectivity and what we, we would call the uh, ideology of objectivity has changed in scientific communities uh, from the er early 19th century up through the uh, contemporary period. Um, and the kinds of persona and subject positions that those notions of objectivity uh, required, the practices that went into producing them, the, the kind of image of them and the, the ontology that they implied. And, and by the way, we can, we'll, we'll share all of these slides afterwards so you can spend more, more time with them or, like, or I guess you can watch the, the recording too. But we, we just wanna um, draw attention to, they end in the 1990 to 20, uh, they actually end in the 1980 uh, period uh, and um, 
their analysis kind of uh, stops there. The, the last two uh, columns are ones that we've added on uh, as to where we see the sciences, uh, the sciences that they uh, talk about as uh, now adopting a kind of in informated uh, objectivity that's um, quite different, but also subsumes some of, some of the, the previous uh, uh, ideals of uh, objectivity. And then the last one is the one that we see ourselves working in, in this kind of depositivist uh, tradition that uh, objectivity ha has been become disseminated, which doesn't, it, it only makes it different. It doesn't make it less objective. Data too is this kind of disseminated um, thing. And the, the key person here is the, the archivist, um, the, the practice is uh, the curation of that data, it, it's structuring, it, it's uh, sharing, uh, and then uh, to be read and reread and, and rewritten. And a lot of that requires these kinds of very light, not heavy structures, but and not absence of structure, but what we call um, light structure in order to continue to work within those different multiverses and to continue um, proliferating um, those. So let me stop there. Um, this is our design group, the people who over the years ha have uh, contributed to peace and, and helping to build it and think about it and, and design it. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge uh, all of them and uh, stop now and um, thank you for your attention. And we are very happy to answer any questions that you uh, might have. And Kim has, Kim has been here all the time, all the time now, but uh, will also join for uh, the questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Bill, are you going to um, as is traditional, chair the questions. <laughs> or not. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you hear me, David? <laughs> yes, I can. Yeah. Yes, I will go ahead and do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, I should have asked you earlier. No, I mean, fine. that was, um, shall I speak so that you get yourself, um, some questions. Yes, I'm just uh, uh, monitoring the chat now. I don't see any questions, but while people are getting their ideas together, uh, if any of the co-conveners have a question to ask, uh, now might be a good time. Okay, I've got a little question just to get us going about um, annotations on the peace platform you said that you call them questions there's no mm -hmm. mention of answers and yeah. um i'm i'm i mean the classic case of that sort of thing would be in museum catalogues where um ethnonyms change and you know where um this is what makutu does very well but from the point of view of museum curators, it's important to contain, to keep the historical record of, yeah, as it were, the wrong labels that one, were once applied. And so you have to have some sort of hierarchicalness that you want to be able to flag one label as being the current approved ones. And here are other ones that have formerly been used and which we now um don't want to use but at the same time it's important to keep a record that they were once used of this object if you see what i mean mm -hmm. do you want to say something about that kim well i can just um start by saying an, a group that we learned a lot from early on was in ancient studies who had these questions about place names and and they actually were really front runners of infrastructure development in part to keep up with this kind of nomenclature shift and debate and that kind of um deliberation over naming i mean i can remember looking at their work thinking do we do this is this the kind of analysis we do and in many ways it's not um but 
I think deliberation over naming and the, the way that concepts and terminology actually are valenced in ways that kind of speak to or don't speak to phenomena we're interested in is a key part of the kind of collaborative exchange that happens on the platform. And so it, that would occur in the answer. So in an, an annotation poses a question and an annotator, a user of the platform would answer it. And it would be in that answer field that the deliberation over meaning would happen. And that would come up in a search within the platform, even if it's not in the question itself. And one of the things that we encourage with our tagging system is to consider if your tag should be shared. You know, for example, writing Bhopal with a capital B versus not, you know, like what it's, um, or, but also feeling free to add tags if a different nomenclature actually does work for you. And so mm -hmm. structuring it in as a kind of moment of selection, whether you're going to participate in a shared vocabulary or not. Hmm. Okay, Th thank you, that's helpful. Bill, I think you're muted. Any other questions? Um, I don't see anything in the chat at the moment. I'd like to ask something that was fascinating. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed hearing about all of that. And I must confess, I'm not from anthropology. I'm from sociology, so I'm um, uh, learning lots of new things. But um, uh, one of the things I was interested in is I think as a community, I can really see how um, the way that you're theorizing it is really appealing. And I think it allows for this kind of creative opportunities for people to um, you know, come to different conclusions and have different kind of conversations. And I really enjoyed that about about um, the platforms and how it's designed. But I was wondering about when you're trying to um, locate it in wider discussions of how we should share data and how we should, um, you know, converge rather than kind of have these multiple voices, um, how difficult it is. Because I find as a qualitative researcher, often we're kind of always framing our work in relation to more quantitative disciplines or medical sciences or whatever, and how you can kind of push back against that and just create something that, that is important um, uh, to, to us as a discipline, I suppose. And, and have you found any tensions in that relationship um, or not? Uh, tensions in the relationship between the qualitative and the more natural sciences or yeah I suppose just trying to communicate to both audiences because I think um on the one hand we're trying to kind of collate around an idea of of um what research should look like that there could be multiple ways of understanding and multiple ways of knowing whereas in mm -hmm. um some disciplines that's a very big jump in relation to how they would often vision the world and so sometimes I find it kind of problematic when you're trying to to sort of locate this work as part of that wider conversation uh, um, and how you how you navigate that while not alienating the people who are closest to this work I suppose it's not a very well phrased question but it's what it's the tensions between those things I think no no I think it, it that that's helpful and gives me some things to to think about so I put a link in the the chat I, I think you can all um, link from it um, which is another project here that we're um, fond of and have learned from and have been in conversation with, which is the Qualitative Data Repository at um, Syracuse University. Um, and this large, this did largely come out of sociology. And it, when it first started, it was mostly very highly structured um, data census data, um, survey data, and then you would archive your survey instrument as well too. They, um, they've just added the capacity to do annotations through it's this kind of web overlay called Hypothesis, um, which requires a, a separate account and it, that's made life both interesting uh, and, and problematic for them of trying to figure out how to arc how to preserve their data such that it preserves the annotations that are on this entirely separate plat platform. But um, the, the, uh, I, I think what gets to your, your question is that 
Um, well, one, um, they have their, a lot of their data is uh, very different, but s some of it is becoming more similar. So they, they will just have, they'll have uh, different kinds of documents. They'll have some uh, images and they're there. People deposit them. They're there to be um, sh shared for other people to access them. The two major differences are, again, the annotation happens in this overlay um, space, which is, is uh, one way to do it. Ours are more completely collapsed so that the annotation literally becomes part of the data object in a way that it's kept um, separate here. I would also say, and this comes more from the com conversation with the sociologist and political scientist uh, uh, a lot, um, people, uh, who use uh, ethnographic methods um, and uh, do kind of at least what they think they think of as ethnographic uh, analysis, but the emphasis in those disciplines and particularly in political uh, science is on uh, the reproducibility and validation of those interpretations and, and uh, the arguments. And so it's a kind of, uh, it, it's a way to sort of check to make, make sure that people have done their work properly and correctly and come up with the right interpretation. And that is specific to those communities. It's something that they need and want and, and value. And, and that's part of what, again, what we would call their data culture or their data ideology. And so their infrastructure very much reflects that. And our, our infrastructure is attempting something a, a little bit different, which is less on that validation and um, uh, kind of seal of confirmation on an interpretation and an argument and more about, and this goes back to David's question about our questions. Um, and the reason why we, instead of using a, a category, we, we use a question, which is that people are literally encouraged to respond in their own way without, uh, they can see other interpretations and other re responses to that, that question, but uh, it, it's a cumulative thing and, and uh, uh, the, the accumulation is accumulation of difference rather than an accumulation of the same that kind of um, validates what, what's come before. So I, I, I don't know if that, that begins at least to, to an, an answer your, your, your question, but it's something that we, um, it, it is a struggle to make kind of um, clear and, and um, uh, hearable in, in the, the value of it. And again, uh, we've been in these conversations with, um, and I use the political scientists as an example, not, uh, not as anything against them, but just as a way that their concerns are very different and they want that reproducibility or that uh, at least the appearance of reproducibility and validation. And they're trying to um, uh, archive qualitative data in that light, um, it, but it, it it ends up being a different archival structure than the than the than the one that we do, and they don't they 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 understand what we're what we're after and what we're trying to do, but it's just not something that um, as a discipline they um, they value highly. Okay, David, did you have a, another question? I think you might Sorry. be muted. I am muted, I was muted, I am no longer muted. Um, I have two questions really. I have a very, I have a big question and a technical question which is in its, which is big in its implications. Let me ask the big general question first, which is about the people that you have not mentioned who are also players in this space. And I suppose in 
North America, the key people are the Smithsonian and Copar. Um, and mm -hmm. I suppose also perhaps the AAA as the big beasts. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, but it's really Copar that I'm, I suppose I'm more interested in. Um, should I tell you what my small, smaller question sure. is? Okay, so that's about interoperability standards and mm -hmm. which has implications both for sharing searches. Can Is there a way that I could search you and a Makutu um, archive at the same time? Mm -hmm. Or can I take my data out of Makutu and put it into put it in. peace or vice versa? And of course, there are European equivalents of all this which also, I mean, this is where the interoperability comes in and at the very least, is there a way of searching everyone? Yeah. So for the record, those are two big questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, let me start with the second one. The second one is something we very much are have in our kind of horizon of where we want to go and where we want to be. Um, so in our next level of development, it includes an API, which will allow data export and import, but all of that has to be configured too. And it has to be those. So the fields, our fields have to match Mukutu's field. And a lot of those do match, but they don't have an annotation field. So there's going to be that kind of problem. But the idea would be that yeah, it would be great to be able to search across both all of our instances, but also across Mukatu's instances and across the qualitative data repository to combine these in what we give it the acronym of RICH, which is uh, research. research in collaborative hermeneutics um, or in research infrastructure for collaborative hermeneutics. Um, and that's a very much a future thing, but that would be the ideal. And I will say that for me, a lot of this comes from watching um, the uh, in genomics and in the life sciences, the different model organism databases. So you have the fly database, you have the worm database, you have the human database. And for a long time, those could not speak to each other, but because they have a lot of money, <laughs> they could make them uh, talk to each other. And now they are combined. So now you can search across all of those and combine them. So that's the, that is the kind of vision that we have. Wait, let me, I'll add there that I really think it's un, incumbent upon us in the field to begin asking for the resources to build that integrative research infrastructure. I mean, it's been done in other fields and had an incredible um, vitalizing effect. And somehow there's not that kind of sense of shared responsibility in, yet in, in anthropology and even at, at kindred fields. And so that's a culture thing in itself, the sense that it's not seen as signal, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so as to your first big question, um, that's really too big. So maybe I'll just take a, a, a piece of it, which is that, you know, we've, uh, again, have learned a lot from those projects and particularly um, Joshua Bell at the, the Smithsonian. Um, Bob Leopold was on our um, advisory board when we were editors of uh, cultural anthropology. And we learned a lot both about open access and the beginnings of, we hadn't really started to build in infrastructure then, but um, we learned a lot uh, from him about the value of making um, uh, data uh, 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 available in, in, in new ways. So the thing that we, I think, one really distinguishing characteristic that we would make is that all of those, um, COPAR, the Smithsonian, the AAA, to whatever extent that they're doing it, are represent these big institutional actors. So if you're, uh, and, and uh, this goes back to the expense things, it's, it's 
for people who have massive collection and the we've talked about this with the Mike Fisher, the North American Mike uh, Fisher, who has this basement uh, that is an, literally an, an archive in, in itself of materials that he's collected over, you know, decades. Digitizing that is just a nightmare or the idea of digitizing that would be a nightmare. But he is someone who it's conceivable that the Smithsonian would take his materials and it, it slowly begin to digitize them and so on. Our, uh, our, our kind of, um, one of the users that we always had in our imagination is the graduate student who's in the process of just building their, their archive um, who is at the moment nobody <laughs> worth the, that kind of institutional attention, but deserves to have their data structured in a way that it can be preserved for the future and, and somehow imported into some larger uh, ar archive, but is not going to happen unless they start now. And making those materials available to people who otherwise, you know, would never be able to, to access it. Those are the kinds of non-institutionalized actors that uh, I think of as our, uh, uh, our, our first line users that it, it, it's really meant to be a kind of low tech, um, uh, low overhead uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, that would allow them to work in ways that um, only uh, only the the chiefs could previously work. Thank you One very thing much. Note, which I know you're aware of is American Anthropology Association has not at all committed to non-proprietary software, and so it just makes the work of trying to build this ecology of technologies much more difficult. Um, the other thing I would add is it goes back to your first question of, I mean, I, I teach a lot of uh, research design kind of grad seminars where I'm trying to help people begin digital practices at the early stage of their career. And the challenge of how do you, um, how do you anticipate discoverability 10 or 20 years out where you wanna make your material discoverable in ways you can't imagine. That's the whole point, that it would be a different imaginary. And so that kind of, um, and I, I certainly don't know the answer, but it's an, it's an interesting hermeneutic space of anticipating what you can't anticipate so that you kind of build um, a data commons that can produce a different kind of, just be a resource for the field going forward, like the mouse database has been in biology. Thank you. Um, one relevant initiative, which actually I don't know what's happened to it, a few years back, um, Quali Data, which is part of the UK Data Archive, um, uh -huh. did a project to make an interchange format for en Envivo and similar qualitative yeah. data um, analysis programs but in terms yeah. of focusing on what's going to be helpful for research students I think that I mean yeah. granted how heavily those software packages are being pushed um, right. and that was another that's yeah that's been another motivator for us as well that uh, Envivo and Atlas TTI and those kind of uh, Max QDA, um, those kinds of packages, which are proprietary, um, uh, we were trying to, we are trying to provide a, a, an alternative to those, but also, and this is one of the paper, we have like notes on, on this, but have never really quite pulled it all together, how our approach differs from the grounded theory approach that underlies a lot of those uh, packages. And part of the, that has to do with our shift from codes, uh, a coding structure to a, a question uh, structure. And that's not an entirely clean uh, division, um, but that begins to get at, at how we think of ourselves differently from those um, uh, uh, qualitative analysis. CACDAS, Computer Assisted Qualitative Data Analysis Systems. Yeah. <laughs>
Great. Any other uh, questions or comments uh, that people might have? Either you can either put those into chat, or I think we can even probably take hands at this point if anybody wants has has something they want to express. Final questions or thoughts? Uh, maybe I can just ask one quick question that, um, and it's related to your comment really in passing about, uh, I think if I understood correctly about disciplinary cultures and maybe their uh, um, openness to sharing data. I, I, I think that's what the comment was about. Yeah. I just wondered if in, in, in sort of being involved in this for, for, for such a time, you have come across that in sort of concrete ways. And, and if so, if you can give us an idea of what that looks like and, and maybe uh, what remedies might exist uh, if it is an issue. And specifically, maybe uh, I'd be interested in any thoughts you might have about anthropology specifically uh, with that regard. Um, so I hope that question makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and again, for the record, that's not a little question. That's a big, yeah, a big sure question. It but, um, it's a big question that, that we, we like. And I'll start by saying this is something that we um, observed a lot in the Research Data Alliance. And I wanted to be, ha take this, uh, the opportunity that you provided to make sure that I, d I don't want to idealize the, the natural sciences and like they share data and, and we don't. I mean, in general, that's truer than not, but in, in the RDA, they recognized that a big part of their challenge in different disciplines was to, and they talked about it in terms of cultural change, that they had to get people used to the idea of sharing their data. Uh, and then, you know, that would uh, uh, encourage them to be involved in building the infrastructure that could make that happen. But the first thing was to uh, cultivate that culture of data sharing, which different some fields had, but some fields um, didn't. The environmental sciences had it more than I, I think I would say most uh, uh, others, and in part because environment. <laughs> um, you, you can't work on the environment without other people working on the environment. So um, there are those cultural differences within the sciences, and then there are the differences between them and between the um, between uh, 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 other researchers in the humanities and social sciences. And we had, within RDA, we had the uh, constantly kind of differentiate ourselves uh, because um, they would think, oh, you're an anthropologist. Well, so you're social scientists. And we'd say, well, yes. And we actually are housed in the School of Social Sciences, but we're the kind of social scientists who think of themselves as using more humanities <laughs> oriented uh, interpretive um, methods, theoretical uh, frameworks and, and, and so on. And that doesn't apply to all anthropologists either. But at the same time, we weren't digital humanists who tend to work with already existing uh, uh, archives, somebody's letters, uh, different vari variations on, you know, first edition, second edition, third edition text. I mean, a, a whole different kind of thing, but they're not constantly producing new empirically derived uh, um, uh, data. So they might have a, they have a kind of well-established, we should, we need to open up the letters of Emily Dickinson to a, a wider audience, but it's the letters of Emily Dickinson. And once you do it, you're kind of uh, done. Whereas for us, it's always going to be more of a kind of ongoing thing. And again, people, I think still largely in the, certainly in, in anthropology, it, the idea that, uh, um, you know, this is my data and, and this is where we are very much like the sciences, at least in some regards, it's like, it's my data, I need to get my publications 
out of it before I start sharing it with other people who, you know, might scoop me on some, but we, and so that the idea of being scooped and being first to the punch is part of the culture change that we try to actively work on. It's like, look, when there's multiple, when there's multiple, multiple interpretations to be had, there is no scooping. Um, people will make different use of your data. So that becomes much more of a reason to sh share it without fear that they're going to beat you to the punch um, with the only uh, interpretation that's possible. I'll add a couple things to that. One, just as an example that we're not, we as a field aren't completely different is I was in a conversation with people at the USGS, which is the US Ge Geologic Survey, so the geographers that work for the government. And they had just hired someone to come in and help build a community of practice uh, for open data sharing. And this is like government geographers, and they still feel like they need to do the social work of building a community of practice, which, I mean, so in a sense, we're walk, walking right alongside those. But I, in my experience in anthropology, there is this kind of Lockean sense that like I did the work, therefore it's mine. And ironically, the, the, the growing recognition that research can be extractivist plays right into that because the sense that I won't share it because to share it would further the extraction. And so you just get these kind of chains of meaning that um, return you to the kind of scholar as landlord kind of figure. And I think that my experience teaching grad students, they can hear that and they can hear how we are reproducing that which we critique in our practice. But it's when you're actually in the system and you see someone else's reading of a, a data artifact and the, the incredible generativity of seeing their reading, making you think something different, not the same. And so like an, a really ethnographic driven analysis where, you know, I would see David's reading of something and, it, and, it, and the way it prompts further interpretation, there's, a, there's really a huge pleasure in it, but the generativity of collaborative, what we call collaborative hermeneutics, it really is quite catching. Like you, I think you almost have to get it in your muscle memory before you believe it, but it, uh, it, in my experience, it works. But some people are so um, so protective they won't even go into that space. And uh, uh, now that Kim has said that, it makes me want to add. So it, that's true at the graduate level, but also I think one of the values of these kinds of ar archives. Uh, and here I will put in a really good word for uh, a HRAF, the Human Resources Area Files, is that their use in the undergraduate classroom to give undergraduate students access to quote raw data and you know force them to do those kinds of interpretive analyses and learn what it means to work with that kind of data and think about it and develop their own interpretations of it you know hraf in its own way is great for that and we also see it in our work too of like teaching, the teaching of anthropology can be so in, enabled by these kinds of archives where students aren't being hit with kind of already pre-made uh, interpretive analyses, but are forced to do their uh, own and forced to work with I I interview data or images or, or, or you know, other, other uh, documentations or like, here, watch this 45, 45 minute um, meeting between the, these, you know, uh, community activists and the the city council, and tell us what you see going on in, in the in those in, in interactions. It's really it, it's a great. Uh, <laughs> it, it bodes well, I, I think, for the future of anthropology to have these kind these new kinds of interpret uh, new kinds of opportunities for teaching and learning interpretation and interpretive analysis. I'll add to that too, is I think there's, um, there's still a habit or the way that at least our grad students are trained to prepare their grant applications and things. 
they think of data very narrowly, interviews and field notes. And all the other stuff, like all the gray material you collect, I mean, government reports, NGO flyers, recordings of now, I mean, just the kind of availability of recorded social interactions, or, you know, like you go and look at census data to get one little insight into something, that's a data set. And so the idea that, you, and like a, in my world of environmental problems, like there's all this stuff floating around the internet that is like official government data, but there's no date on it. You have to kind of find it, cook it up a little for it to become data. <laughs> and so I think that part of data sharing is thinking more expansively about what our data is. Can I just add to that? Unfortunately, Antonia Wolford, who was here and has had to leave, um, can I just put in a plug for her work on collecting um, environmental data from the Amazon? Um, absolutely uh -huh. wonderful ethnography of the actual process of data collection and, and what it means. And it relates a lot to what you've both been saying. Um, and I, you've also actually, Kim's um, earlier comment prompted me to think on why I'm so passionate about the importance of archiving anthropological resources. Um, and it really comes down to my intellectual biography that I was fortunate enough to meet the first anthropologist who worked in Mambilla. And he let me copy his field notes, and I was fortunate enough to be able to read his notes in the village where he worked. And so at one sense, I'm an ideal reader, and I didn't understand everything at all, but I understand quite yeah. a lot. It's not an either right. or. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's so important to get that message across. No, and the that that uh, I, I think that's another part of uh, the the, uh, the data ideology um, uh, of anthropology is when you say, well, you know, we're we're encouraging the sharing of field notes. It's like all of my field notes. I can't. This, no, not all of your field notes. Like, but how about a, some a couple of pages or, or or selections or you know go through and redact some things and transfer them to a different format, but you don't have to share everything but you can share more than you are exactly exactly yeah Fantastic. cool i think we're out of questions and out of time david uh i will stop um <laughs> i could talk all night <laughs> so thank you very much for a fascinating uh talk and thanks everybody for your questions and uh, thank you for the the venue and thank you for listening and asking such great questions too. It's they've been really helpful for us to think. Excellent. Um, we'll see everyone in two weeks' time. Um, and I can't remember who it is in two weeks' time. <laughs> it will be another seminar. <laughs> there will be. It'll be another TBA. Right. Thanks. And thanks again. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, bye.